Are you wondering what you can do to finally get that blood pressure to come down naturally? I'm Dr. David DeRose. I want to tell you about three overlooked keys to high blood pressure control. Actually, some of you may have engaged with this material before if you've read my books or if you've seen the new video series we recently released called The Methuselah Factor, the video companion. And uh, actually, we're going to be sharing with you some of that video footage in this presentation. So what are those three keys? Well, the first one has to do with exercise. Now you say, oh, I don't need to hear this. I already have heard hundreds of times about how I need to exercise. No, I'm going to tell you about something very simple that you can do. Anybody can do it. Even a person in a wheelchair can do this form of exercise. It has been clinically demonstrated to lower blood pressure. So that is going to be the first key. The second key has to do with something in your diet. And uh, this is not what most people think. You really have to stay tuned because the second element, the second overlooked key is something that may be uh, undermining your blood pressure control efforts in ways that you never realized. And then the final element has to do with something I love to talk about. A lot of times on videos and people think, well, this is uh, to sell you on something. Actually, this third element will actually save you money. It is about fasting. I'll share with you some high points of material I've presented about fasting over the years, and it is something calculated to improve blood fluidity and help with blood pressure. Well, with that introduction, we're going to actually show you some film clips. Like I said, they originally uh, came out uh, under the umbrella of this Methuselah Factor DVD series. We're going to show you uh, those presentations, at least selections from them, because I want you to realize how powerful, first of all, this particular type of exercise is. Let's take a look. We're talking about getting a grip. As we begin, I'm actually turning right into the book, The Methuselah Factor, page 132, and it's instructing me to actually get a grip strength device. So I happen to have one right here. And um, I've also got my timer all set. Okay. We got it going here. There we go. You say, what am I doing? I'm actually getting a grip and it really relates to something that often happens when I'm giving a lecture about health, the Methuselah factor, other topics. People say, but when if I can't exercise? You encourage walking or running. What happens if I'm wheelchair bound? What do I do? Well, right now you're looking at one strategy. That's using a grip strength device. What I'm doing is called isometric exercise. My hand is not pumping this grip strength device. It's holding it firmly. Now, if I were following the protocol in my book, I'd have chosen a grip strength device that causes me to exert a grip strength about 30% of my maximal contraction. And I haven't actually measured this particular device, but I'm guessing this is somewhat close, maybe a little bit closer to 50%. But what I'm going to be doing is holding this for two minutes. That's why the timer is running. If you're wondering where we're at, we're about halfway through. What I'm going to do once that timer goes off is I'm going to take a break for one minute and I'm going to switch hands. The protocol is actually one that's been used, it's been studied, and what they actually find is this particular grip strength activity. If you do it three times a week, each exercise session, you do four sets. One with one hand, then one with the other. A minute break in between. Then you switch back to this hand, then back to the other, so you get four sets in. You say, what happens when you do that? They've actually demonstrated some impressive things as I map out in the book. Significant blood pressure lowering is one of the results of using this isometric grip strength. Here's the interesting thing. They've also looked at this isometric type. Wait, there's the timer going off. Let me stop here. We've got to get this on now for a minute. Okay. Okay, there we go. Okay. And uh, now we're taking our rest. So remember, so it's two minutes, one minute rest, and then we're going to do two minutes over here. 
And uh, we're not going to finish the whole series if you figure it out, because with that one minute rest and the four two minute sessions, one minute rest between each one, it comes out to about 11 minutes. And this segment won't be that long. But once the one minute has passed, then guess what? I'm using my left hand to do the grip strength. But, but let me tell you why we're doing it. Not only is this an exercise that you can do that has measurable benefits on your blood pressure, but they've also linked this isometric exercise, isometric exercise in general, exercise where you're not changing the length of muscles. That's what iso means the same, metric, like think of a unit of measure, okay? So you're not changing the length of the muscles. And uh, we're basically ready to switch here. So get our two minutes on. Okay, so now we're doing the left hand. But you notice my hand not pumping, it's isometric. And even though you might say, this is simple, I could do it while I'm watching TV, you're doing it while you're filming a video. That's the whole idea. Get a grip is about doing simple isometric exercises. Include that in your routine. It may be something as simple as the grip strength exercise that I'm illustrating, or it may be some other forms of isometric exercise. But my message is simply this. Although I grew up with the idea, at least as a young medical student, that aerobic exercise was king. It was running, it was cross country skiing, it was ice skating, swimming, bicycling, you name it, using those large muscle groups, continuous activity, getting the heart and lungs working. Yes, that's important for optimal blood fluidity, but so is resistance exercise. Think about it. Three times a week, an 11 minute activity, grip strength in both hands, you can significantly lower your blood pressure, you can improve your hemorrheology. So don't you think you could incorporate more resistance exercise, isometric resistance exercise into your program? Just get one of those grip strength devices and you could be well on your way to lower blood pressure. But I promised you a dietary insight as well. Now, granted, most people get this dietary constituent in beverage form, not actually in something they eat. Your minds may be connecting the dots because it has to do with some of our most popular beverages and how they're undermining our blood pressure control efforts. The surprising thing, this compound may be doing its greatest damage not because of how it worsens your blood fluidity or raises your blood pressure. It has been found to do both, but also it affects how our brain functions, and that may be undermining your ability to develop new lifestyle habits and stick with them. We're talking, you guessed it, about caffeine. Let's go to some footage that I recorded earlier about caffeine, a second element, overlooked element for optimizing your blood pressure. I'm Dr. David DeRose. The challenge, cut the caffeine. Now, I know that may not sound all that palatable, but realize I'm saying just cut down on the caffeine unless you want to go all the way and cut it out. Why would you want to do that? Let me tell you Roger's story. Roger was a patient of mine, of course, not his real name. Some years ago, he came to a residential lifestyle center. And as I went through Roger's history, I mean, the man was dealing with severe pain. He had chronic back problems. He had a lung issue. He was on oxygen. He did not seem to be the type of person that I would expect to improve dramatically with a lifestyle program. But as I went through his medical history, I came up with a few things that I thought he could improve. He really was doing pretty well overall. But one of the things I highlighted was a request for him to stop his use of caffeine. Now, mind you, he was just using, I think, one or two cups of coffee a day. Roger didn't let on during that visit, but I later learned from him that he was extremely upset with me, that I would take away his caffeine when really he was doing so well in so many other respects. Well, Roger stuck with the program during his time with us. He went home, he continued on that lifestyle. And to my amazement, when I saw him some six months later, Roger was hiking mountains without oxygen and without pain. As I spoke with him about his improvement, he attributed some of his success to leaving off the caffeine. 
just wishful thinking, just a misconnection of the dots? I don't think so. The medical research indicates that caffeine impairs blood fluidity. If you're talking about improving your overall health, we've seen that improving the Methuselah factor, improving blood fluidity is powerful. When you drink caffeine, it interferes with a healthful compound known as a adenosine. Adenosine is involved with relaxing blood vessels, making your platelets less sticky. So when you drink that caffeine, when the adenosine is messed up in your body, your platelets get stickier, your blood gets less fluid, your arteries constrict more, and you have blood flow problems. If that was all there was with caffeine, maybe we could overlook it. But years ago, I had the privilege of studying under the late Dr. Burnell Baldwin. Dr. Baldwin so inspired me, he actually is the one to whom I dedicated the book, The Methuselah Factor. It was Dr. Baldwin that, that really introduced me to the wonders of hemorrheology, blood fluidity. Baldwin told me and my fellow classmates that caffeine was dubbed by the famous Russian scientist Pavlov as bad habit glue. And by that, Pavlov meant that if you were using caffeine, it would be more difficult to develop new behaviors. We're talking about a 30-day journey, a challenge every day. If you want to be optimally successful, caffeine could interfere. In fact, some would say, will likely interfere with your ability to develop these new behaviors. Let me just illustrate this for you by tackling one of the objections I've heard when it comes to cutting back on the caffeine. Some have said, hey, I read an article. It said, if I want to live longer, I need to drink coffee. Some years ago, a study was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. It was the first time I heard that claim made, drink more coffee, live longer. And so I decided to actually read the actual scientific journal article. You know, if you just read what comes out in the lay press, you might be misled. And so as I was reading through this New England Journal of Medicine study, I learned it was an incredibly well-designed study. Over 600,000 individuals in it. They were looking at detailed lifestyle factors. And they looked at coffee drinking. Now listen to a statement from the article. It's included in my book, The Methuselah Factor. In age-adjusted analyses, coffee consumption was associated with increased mortality among both men and women. They say, wait a minute. The lay press said that this study showed that people who drank coffee lived longer. But if you understood what I just read in Medicalese, they were saying, when you compare two people of a given age, the one who drank more coffee died sooner. So wait a minute, how, how could it be? How could the raw data show one thing and the researchers and the press come to a totally opposite conclusion? Here's how. Because when they looked at those who were drinking more coffee, they found the more coffee a person drank, the more it was associated with, listen, smoking cigarettes, drinking more than three alcoholic beverages a day, eating more red meat, having lower educational attainments, neglecting to engage in vigorous physical activity, and consuming fewer fruits and vegetables. All of these things are known to shorten our lifespan. Are you seeing what's going on here? The researchers found that coffee drinking was associated with bad habits. The very thing we would expect if Pavlov and Dr. Baldwin were right. Well, what happened then? The researchers in the New England Journal of Medicine study tried to correct for all these bad habits, and they came to the conclusion that once you undid all the effects of the smoking and the poor diet and the lack of exercise and lack of educational attainment, coffee actually helped you live longer. Now, I know that may seem laughable. It's not. It's not laughable at all. The, the researchers were doing just what we'd expect them to do to try to isolate the effects of one factor. But the whole point is this. The fallacy of coming to a conclusion that is different than what the actual free living people are illustrating. I call it a fallacy. Other people would argue. They say I'm being too strong with my judgment. But here's my point. What the research is really underscoring is my big concern with caffeine. That it's going to get in the way of you getting on a more optimal lifestyle. So cut down on the caffeine. 
Leave it out all together if you're bold enough and you're on your way to better blood fluidity. So what would it look like to cut down on your caffeine or maybe even leave it out altogether? I know that may sound like cruel and unusual punishment, but it can make a big difference when it comes to optimizing your lifestyle. But I promised you three overlooked keys to blood pressure control. And the third one I already told you at the beginning of the series was, well, fasting. Just how powerful fasting can be, not realized by many people, at least in my experience as a physician. I'm going to share with you another uh, presentation that I gave dealing with eating more green leafy vegetables and how fasting can help you optimize your intake of phytochemicals and can also do some profound things for your blood fluidity, which in turn can lower your blood pressure and decrease your risk of a host of complications. Again, this video first came out in the series, The Methuselah Factor, 30 Daily Videos to Enhance Your Diet and Lifestyle Program. Let's take a look. Now, some years ago, we knew a young lady, she would not eat vegetables at all. She would not eat many fruits even. She was clearly in the meat and potato department, but leaving off the potatoes. You get the picture? How are you going to get somebody like that to dramatically increase their intake of green leafy vegetables? Well, here's what I suggest. If it's just too much to think of stomaching vegetables every day or most days of the week, you have another way that you can go green. I'll allow you to go on the leaf, stem, and flower fast. It's one of my all-time fasts as far as putting patients on fast. I really enjoy this fast because it has a margin of protection. You're allowing people to eat what we call low glycemic index foods, foods that do not tend to raise blood sugar. What are we talking about? Leaf, stem, and flower foods. We're talking about leafy vegetables like kale, like collards, like lettuce, like spinach. You get the picture? We're talking about stem and flower vegetables like celery, like asparagus, like cauliflower, like broccoli. You get the picture, right? So you can eat any of these foods, and we say one day a week, if you're going on the least stem or flower fast, one day a week, you can eat any of those foods. You can juice them. Granted, they're not very palatable juiced. You can steam them. You can eat them raw. That day, it's just leaf stem flower fast. You say, Dr. Rose, I hate this stuff. I I could tolerate celery. Well, maybe that's all you're going to eat for the day. It's just celery. Now you say, could this be dangerous? Well, it could be if you're on medication for blood sugar, if you're on medication for blood pressure. In fact, some of the blood pressure drugs can raise potassium levels and you'd be getting a lot of potassium in those fruits and vegetables. So here's the bottom line. If you have questions about the safety of such a practice, definitely, like I've been encouraging you in this series, talk with your primary care provider. If you've got kidney issues, definitely. This is not a diet that you want to go on. You don't want to ramp up your plant food consumption. You can get into big trouble. Talk with your renal dietitian or your nephrologist if you're trying to see if you can safely incorporate some additional plant foods. Well, there you have it. Three overlooked keys. Three overlooked keys to optimizing your blood pressure. Hopefully you enjoyed that material. If you'd like more, I've got a lot of free resources on my YouTube channel, which is simply Compass Health Consulting. You can also go to my website, compasshealth.net. We've got free materials as well as places you can pick up my books and videos. Take advantage of these resources. Lifestyle is powerful and it can help you get in charge of your blood pressure without additional medications. I'm Dr. David DeRose.